Welcome to The Jay Martin Show. This is Jay Martin, and my guest today is Harley Bassman, who was a bit of a legend through the 80s and the 90s at Merrill Lynch and Credit Suisse in the mortgage-backed securities market, which is a market that admittedly I don't really understand much about. I don't allocate any cash that direction. I haven't yet, probably won't because it's not my wheelhouse, but I'm curious about it specifically because right now Harley is wildly bullish on the mortgage-backed securities market. And I'm looking at all the indicators in terms of housing price correction, uh, mortgage cost doubling, and thinking how can anybody be bullish on anything related to the housing market. And he explains very eloquently why those two things don't necessarily correlate the way I thought they would. So a really interesting macro discussion. Uh, we also touched on the inflation narrative, the recession narrative, and I got Harley's perspectives on both of those things. Then we got a bit philosophical, as I like to do, and uh, got into all kinds of fun topics towards the end of the interview. I hope you enjoy this one. A few things before we jump in. Number one, there's a pinned comment beneath this interview where you can subscribe to my weekly newsletter. I love publishing it. Join the team every Sunday and get a piece from me where I share my greatest takeaways and lessons learned from conversations just like this and plenty of others. Um, and here's Harley Bassman. All right, enjoy. This is Jay Martin. All right, welcome back to the Jay Martin Show and I'm here with Harley Bassman. Harley, it's great to have you on. Thanks so much for making the time. Thank you very much. Okay, I want to jump right into a call that you've been making recently and correct me if I'm off the mark here, but you are wildly bullish on mortgage-backed securities. And I wanted to jump into this because you're the man when it comes to this MBS, the other MBS. And I'm not. It's really an area of the market that I spend very little time, so I'm curious to learn more. Um, talk to me about your bullish sentiment and what you're seeing. And if even for the, the simplest um, explanation, why invest in a mortgage-backed security? Sure. Okay, so so let's, let's remember that there, there's there was the subprime debacle, that was bad. That was you know people uh, banks lending money to people who couldn't pay pay the money back. Um, and then there's the real legit mortgage backed securities market, which is Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Ginnie Mae. Yeah. Um, and so this is your your ordinary banks or mortgage brokers or whoever it might be, and they make they they, they create loans, uh, they fund them. They sell them to Fannie or Freddie. Um, they then wrap these loans and then put them into a big bucket and send them back to, to, to banks to go and sell and trade in the market. So you'll have pools of a billion dollars, billions of dollars of thousands and thousands of loans in there. And all those loans need to be of a certain quality. Um, you might, you've heard of a prime loan and there's subprime. Sub means under prime. Yeah. Uh, what is prime? Prime means a 720 FICO. That's where the FICO score came in, you know, all these years ago. 720 and above your prime, below your subprime. 690, you're still okay. Um, and, and in Wall Street, we were making loans like that. Uh, when you started getting into the, you know, high 500s, well, now you're talking, you know, it's going to go south as a matter of when. Mm. Um, you can go and measure the spread of a Fannie Mae mortgage bond, its yield, over that of a, of a treasury. And in general, that spread's gonna be about 75 basis points, three quarters of a percent. So if the treasury is trading at three, a mortgage bond might be 375. Mm. And I put up very, if you go to my website, um, convexdmaven.com, uh, I've written various things about mortgage bonds and I will always include the mortgage spread um, you know, the mortgage bond versus the, the, the interest rate sure. uh, it goes up and down. This spread got as tight as like 40 basis points um, last year at the height of the Fed buying mortgage securities. Um, that was the wrong price. You know, you're only getting paid 40 basis points more, 0.4% more uh, for the risk. Um, it got as high as 135 recently. It's now trading like 120. What are you getting paid for? Why are you getting extra money? That's the key thing over here. You get paid extra, not for credit risk. Fannie, Freddie, Jenny, they're not going under. They are not going bankrupt. Those bonds are as good as treasuries. Um, if Fannie and Freddie go down, you better own cans of tuna and a shotgun, okay? Um, you got bigger yeah. problems than your, than your, than your money. Mm. Um, you get that because the homeowner who has that mortgage, he can prepay whatever he wants. So if he has a 4% loan in this bond 
he says, hey, rates are now three, I'm going to refinance. That 4% loan, poof, gets paid off. It disappears. The mortgage guy gets back $100. Um, and there's a new 3% bond created. So the bonds really, these mortgage bonds can't go much above 104, 105, 106, because once they get that high in dollar price, that means the coupon is above the market and these bonds will get refinanced, they'll disappear. On the other hand, if you have a 3% mortgage and rates go to five uh, and you're the homeowner, you're gonna say, wow, am I a genius? I have a 3% mortgage, rates are five now, I'm saving a ton of money, I'm never refinancing. As a matter of fact, I really can't even move out of my house now. Because if I sold my house, and paid off my 3% mortgage, I'd have to get a new mortgage of 5%, which would cost a lot more money, and therefore I couldn't afford to buy a house of the same money. So you're almost locked in your house at that stage of the game, which really yeah. slows down the housing market, which we'll get to in a second, I think. Yeah. So yeah. that bond can go to 90 or 80, or it can go down a lot. It's negatively convex. The bond can only get to... 105, 106 if rates go down, and it can go to 80 or 90 if rates go up. It can go down a lot more than it can go up. And let's remind you, what is convexity? Okay, I'm gonna tell it to you as I tell mom and pop, do not get hung up in the delta, gamma, theta garbage. That's just, we throw that, those numbers at you to go make you pay us money for commissions. Convexity is this, if you have an investment or anything really, a profile where for equal changes in the underlying asset, you could make a point or lose a point, that's zero convexity. If you could make two and lose one, positively convex. I could make one I could lose. Lose three, make two, equally convex. That's it. Okay. Nothing okay. more, nothing less. Don't get hung up. Now, why did we hire all these physics PhDs in the 90s? is because we have to figure out what that's worth. If I have an instrument that yields 5% and it can go up by one, down by one, and I have another thing that up to down by one, well, that's worth more money to me. So sure. what's it worth? is it worth 4% or four and a quarter, three cents? It's worth something, but it's worth, it's a, it's a more valuable instrument so that you can pay uh, less for it. And if I'm down three, up two, well, it should be five and a quarter, five and a half. That's what a mortgage bond is, is your short convexity. It can go up by five or six, but down by 10 to 15. And that usually pays you about three quarters of a point more. That's the value of the embedded optionality in that mortgage bond. No, okay, okay. No, I might then, be- So, so, so when, when, we, when the Fed stopped buying because of QT, mortgage bonds went from like 40 basis points over to 135 basis points over at 135, that's, that's just the wrong number. The option is it's just too expensive. It's, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, you know, it's worth, you know, 75, 80 in general times, and that's what it's going to go to again once people kind of get over the panic of the Fed might start selling mortgage securities. Because um, remember, you're not taking any credit risk. All you're taking is convexity optionality risk. Now, mm -hmm. maybe you don't want that risk, which is fine, but if you're willing to take it, you know, I, I think that's a pretty interesting risk. I'd rather get paid 135 for, uh, uh, for, for, for convexity risk than paid, you know, 300 for a junk bond risk, where right. part is zero. Managing your cash through an inflation cycle is one of the most difficult things that money managers today have never had to deal with. It was the 1970s since we saw inflation numbers like we're seeing today. So there's no strategies tried and tested from anybody in the game that really work. I like gold, I like real estate and a handful of other things, but one asset class that has held its value consistently over time, cycle in, cycle out, is fine art. However, if you're like me and know nothing about art, it's pretty hard to find your entry point. That's why platforms like Masterworks, which have essentially democratized access to artists that people like me could normally never afford, like a Picasso or a Banksy or a Van Gogh, I can invest in those masterpieces now through Masterworks. So there's a link in the description of this video. Check out Masterworks if you're looking to put some cash to work in one of the safest and best performing inflation hedges of all time. All right, back to the interview. So now, I'm sure. I'm sure I'm missing something obvious here, Harley, but what, how, how does the future of the housing market impact this opportunity? You know, I, I know that, you know, new uh, median cost of mortgages have doubled in the last 
two and a half years, you're not super pessimistic, I don't believe, on the housing market calling for some 2008 crash, but probably a 20% correction in housing prices across the country. How does that impact the mortgage-backed securities market? From 30,000 feet, zero. Okay. I mean, but, I mean, you own a bond backed by mortgages that are guaranteed by Fannie and Freddie. And that's, that's the it. chicken, There's yeah. No credit risk. I mean, now, the question you're kind of asking is, if we have a housing crisis, what will that do to interest rates? Will it go up or down? Right. That's a fair question. So the performance of the bond, you know, will be impacted by that. Um, but per se, the mortgage security, I mean, it's through the pipeline and kind of done. Now, what you're circling around with, with the when rates went, mortgage rates went from three-ish up to five, so actually got as high as I think almost six, maybe. And now I'm talking the mortgage rate for the homeowner as opposed to the mortgage rate for the bond buyer. Yeah. General, the homeowner pays about 1% more than mm -hmm. what the bond buyer gets. Yeah. So if the homeowner takes out a 4%, a 5% loan, the bond buyer will get um, four. Four percent, yeah. um, because you have all this stuff in the, the Michigan in, in, inside to process everything else. Everyone's yeah. got to get paid as they process all, all the paperwork. Um, yeah. um, that spread got as high as like one fifty recently, um, and it got there because when rates started to go up in January, February, March, everyone rushed to go lock in their mortgages yeah. and lock in that low rate, and yeah. that just filled up all the mortgage companies, and they just basically increased the spread that they worked for as a way to put the brakes on the process. Yeah. As okay. that pipeline clears, that spread's going to come back in. It might go to 75 as these guys try to bring in more business because they have all these people they've hired for the mortgage business in the last few years. Um, and so where could where could housing prices, housing prices aren't going to crash from defaults. You're not going to see defaults. Why not? When you see rates going up the way they are, how come you're not concerned about homeowners defaulting on if they have a variable mortgage and they're, they're... If they have a variable mortgage, yes, but most mortgages are fixed right now, um, so it's locked in. And number two is, because of Dodd-Frank, it was, it was I would say, required, but fairly, very firmly suggested that you really vet your client and make sure they can afford to pay the mortgage. Uh, these these uh, what's called no doc loans. So you can take out a loan without providing your W two or providing your tax returns. Those yeah. are gone. Okay, you have to go and basically prove you don't need the money to borrow money. If you remember, I guess Bernanke was bragging a few years ago that he couldn't get a loan from a company because he didn't have a you know, state of job. Um, right. Okay. That's a little ridiculous, but I mean it was probably true. I'll make you bet some computer if I look at his income and say no, you can't do it, man. So that that is still the case because immediately I'm I'm curious, do is are, are those regulations actually enforced? Right? Yes. Or I mean, everyone's seen The Big Short, and we can kind of like go there on our own mind and say, oh yeah, there's rules, and then there's rules, right? And and there's incentives, right, to get deals done, and and um and so you would say that the diligence done on home buyers over the last ten years just vanishes any risk that we would have faced in the first decade of this, of the 2000s? Is the answer zero? No. Is the answer very close to epsilon? Yes. Sure. I, I, I okay. Noticed. Yeah, that's great. Any any perspective on the Canadian housing market? Because I believe uh, like 75% of new mortgages in the last year in Canada have been variable. And so that would be a bit of a difference. And our housing market coast to coast has been red hot. Any perspective there, Harley? Um. I know that people have been predicting the uh, decline and crash of the Canadian housing market, as well as Canadian banks that make the loans for you know a decade now. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't quite buy into that. I think these banks are, are pretty careful in what they do, and they probably vet the people and what they what they do. So now, are, are housing prices too high up in Vancouver? Yeah, they were. Uh, but I mean, I think that's kind of a, the froths come out of that a little bit as you know regulations have come in to go push back on Chinese money coming in there. But yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, you do bring up a good point, though, which is only the U.S. and Denmark offer 30 year fixed rate mortgages. Almost every other country in the world offers variable mortgages, adjustable mortgages. And yeah. they do that to protect their banks from getting sure. blown up. Uh, the yeah. SNL crisis basically happened when banks were making loans at, you know, 
six, seven, eight percent, and then Volcker took the risk to twenty percent. So mm -hmm. now they're paying twenty, earning eight. Like well, you, it doesn't last very long before you go bankrupt, and thus we had most SNLs get wiped out. Um, you know what? You know what blows my mind is I grew up in Vancouver, British Columbia, which yeah is a world-renowned real estate market, among many other things. And, you know, in the last couple of years, I've been attending a lot of political candidate meetings as we get closer to a provincial election and everybody's putting their candidate forward. And the one debate that occurs at every single one of these meetings that tends to get complete bipartisan support and everybody in the room is nodding in agreement is that we have to do something about the housing crisis and the housing crisis being expensive real estate in Vancouver. And I always find myself as the outlier standing there thinking, what am I missing here? I get real estate's very expensive in Vancouver, but look out a window. It's gorgeous, 360 degrees. You got the Pacific Ocean on one side, coastal mountains on the other. Downtown Vancouver is more or less an island with water on three sides. It's small, we've got great immigration policies. So it's a market the whole world can buy into. Who on earth thinks that this real estate market should be anything but crazy expensive? And I just can't wrap my mind around it, but it's like this consistent debate that never ends. What do you, what do you think? Uh, I'm going to go, at, go out on a limb here and say that uh, you have the exact same problem we have in Southern California or in, or in you know, Manhattan, um, right. which is that there's just huge regulations against building. Um, and, and that, yeah. Because if, you, if you're a basic NIMBY, people who live in single family areas don't want, you know, big multifamily apartment houses built in their neighborhood mm. or low income housing built by them or all these various things. You know, once you, once everyone wants to get into some place, once they're in, they want no one else to come in. Um, that yeah. tends to be how things happen. Uh, is it fair? Is it right? You know, probably a public policy concept. No, but if you already live in Vancouver, you're probably pretty pleased with it. Um, yeah. So I suspect you probably have pretty severe regulations and NIMBY issues uh, locking up new construction. I mean, in Southern California, the regulations to go get a permit, I think like $80,000 before you even put a shovel on the ground. I mean, right. How are you possibly going to go and get a you know a median family home built when you're starting eighty k in the hole, you know? Yeah. Whereas taxes might cost you a thousand bucks for a permit. Right. Okay. Yeah. No. I love it. I love it. Okay. Uh, let's uh, switch to maybe the inflation argument because I think it does relate to the housing market a little bit, at least in my mind. I've heard you speak about you know we're going to see inflation probably for the rest of the year, maybe around six percent. Correct me if I've botched that in some regard, but. The population that really feels the pinch isn't the very top and it isn't the very bottom. It's the middle 60%. And because they're most exposed to the, the basic needs, not eligible for government support. And so they get hit the hardest. Probably also uh, the majority of homeowners. And so would an external in influence like inflation or just you know exponentially rising cost of living contribute to an increased default rate? Is that even significant? And what do you think about that? I'm not worried about defaults. I and mean, will they happen? Yes. Um, and how do you default? You only default for one reason, and that's you lose your job. Other than that, I mean, your, your mortgage is the first thing you pay. Uh, you can cut back on everything else. Um, I think you're circling around the idea of Fed policy and what they're going to go and do. Um, and, you know, basically borrowing from my latest commentary. And by the way, I publish I mean, every four to six weeks on convexthemaven.com. If you have an interest, send me an email, harley at bassman.net, and I'll add you. It's free. No, no tricks. Um, and yes, indeed, the lower quintile hits at about 27,000 of income. Upper quintile takes off at 140, 41. So that's 60% in the middle. They, they, they have no defense against inflation. And if it's running at, you know, four, five, eight, ten percent 10%, that, that's, a, that's a big number for these people. And there's nowhere to hide. Their incomes ain't going up that fast. Right, um, right. And so the Fed's going to go and... Um, they're, they're going to slam on the brakes and um, cause a recession. Are we already in one? Maybe. Um, are we going to be in one? Yeah, that, that, that's coming. Um, and, you know, from a macro policy standpoint, helping the 60% in the middle who have nowhere to hide is probably better public policy than taking unemployment from three and a half to five and a half. I, I feel bad for, the, for those 2% of the people, but 2% versus 60%, you kind of got to go and you know, pick your poison and what you want to do. And so I think the Fed's going to take rates up more than the market is pricing in. I do not see rate cuts coming next year as the futures market seems to be, um, you know, indicating. 
What do you make of the recession debate that I'm hearing everywhere now, including even mainstream platforms like the Joe Rogan podcast last week? They're debating whether or not the U.S. economy is in a recession. And, you know, the, the evidence they'll provide is on one hand, two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. And the counter evidence would be Bud Powell says we're not in one. I listen, I think, does it matter? Like everyone's actually on their own journey and whether or not I'm personally in a recession or not is all that really matters and have I buffered myself against what the broad economy is doing. But what do you, you must be hearing that debate right now. And it's kind of silly. We're arguing about the definition of a word more than the activity in the economy. But what do you think, Harley, about, I mean, you said whether or not right now, who knows, but we definitely will be. So could you elaborate on that a bit for me? Sure. Um, so the yield curve, as a reminder, is the picture, the drawing of yields from the, the, the a low rate, um, three-month bill, six-month bill, up to a 30-year. And usually it goes up because, you know, you should get a higher yield as you take more risk for the uncertainty. Once in a while, it flips, where a two-year treasury yields three and a quarter, and a 10-year treasury yields 275, so 50 basis points negative which seems utterly insane, but here's where we are. What's anomalous, the yield curve, when the yield curve inverts, we get a recession within you know 14 months. That just tends to happen. Uh, I'm not gonna go into why, you can read on my website why this happens. Um, what's strange is the yield curve flipped before the first Fed hike. Usually we flip right at the second to last Fed hike, well into the hiking process. Um, this is crazy. Um, there's a number of reasons we could make up why it's happening, but it's kind of nutty um, for it to flip so early. Um, and the yield curve is flashing big, bright red, hey man, recession coming, that maybe we're already here. Now this notion of being in a recession, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go back to Bill Clinton, like what, 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 what is the meaning of is, um, but, mm. but <laughs> they say a recession is too back-to-back -back negative GDP prints, which we had. The thing is, the last one we had was um, nominal GDP up 7%. So the real, the amount, I don't, I don't use the word real, the, 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 the dollars that sloshed around in the U.S. economy went from $100 to $107. That's pretty big growth. That's the actual yeah. number of dollars moving around, GDP. We had inflation at 8%, though. So that means the real inflation adjusted number is negative one. Can you say that nominal of 7% is actually a recession? I have a hard time buying into that. We've just never had this before where we have these big nominals and we have big inflation numbers. We've you know, in the last 20 years, we've had you know, two and three you know, GDPs and one and two inflation. So they're kind of close. So it's kind of the same thing. That's, that's the problem we have here to figure this thing out is can you really call it a recession? when the nominal number is up at seven and change percent. I tend to think not, um, uh, but we'll find out. Um, but, you know, and, and, and for retail investors, I'll tell you this, inflation is okay in the early stages. Inflation is bullish for stocks. Inflation means the companies are raising their prices. By definition, I mean, prices are higher, right? You're, you're, that's why the CPI is higher because the prices are higher. So the companies are, are taking in more money. So they're high, they have higher profits unless they're, you know, expenses go up by more, which they probably aren't. So they're making a higher profit. Your PE, your E's up. Um, what happens is as rates start to rise with inflation, at some point that discounting factor, the inflation factor drops your PE. Um, and then the stock prices go down. Um, we've not seen E's drop yet. Uh, and you saw, and the stock prices have gone down. They're they're the your long duration, you know, like an Amazon or a Tesla or a, these, all these companies out there. Let's just say that Amazon is going to make a trillion dollars in thirty years. Let's just stipulate, agree that's the number. Sure. The question really is, what's a trillion dollars in thirty years worth today? Right. Right. That's right. where the rate component comes in. And, 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 and um, when rates started going up, that's why you saw all these stocks collapse because we're just putting a discount factor on those earnings. Mm. Um, right now, you still have earnings rising and your rates going down. Like there's a disconnect here between the stock market and the bond market. One of them's wrong. Uh, unclear which one is right now. Usually the bond market is right. I will say that as a bond guy, 
we're usually right. But um, there, it, it is strange to have, um, you know, the bond market flipping inverted this early in the cycle. Got it. Got it. What what scares you right now, Harley, if anything, that you're seeing? Is it the the broadness or the scope of a potential recession that could hit the United States? What what are there any trigger points in your periphery that you're like, if that were to hit, that could be really, really bad? OK, um, the number one risk people should worry about is the correlation of stocks to bonds. So for the last 20 years, that correlation has been inverted. Stocks up, bonds down, and vice versa. That's why your 60-40 portfolio has worked so well, because what you make on one side, you lose a little bit on the other, and vice versa, you're hedged. They don't, if they went up and down together, you'd have a much more volatile portfolio, and you probably wouldn't sleep at night too well. Now, we've had this correlation flip, where they move in unison twice in the last number of years. March of 2020, stocks and bonds both went down. Right. November, December of 2018, they both went down. Both times the Fed jumped in to save the day. Yeah. Because when you get them both going down together, there's nowhere to hide. And if you're levered, well, then you're just wiped out. Um, that correlation, I won't say that it's a known fact, but there's a really, really good bunch of charts that show in the past when inflation's gotten above two, three and rates have gotten above three, four, the correlation flips. And so what concerns me is if we get that correlation to flip, so stocks and bonds move together, that'd be bad. And how might that happen? What if the Fed just keeps driving these rates higher because they're going to take inflation down no matter what? And right. they're just, the blinkers are on, we're taking inflation down. Um, the market, bond market does not believe that. The bond market is saying rates are going to peak uh, at, you know, three and a half ish, um, 375, somewhere in there, the front end rates um, in December this year. And they'll be cutting rates by 50 cents by December of next year. Um, I'm hearing that a lot. Yeah. The, well, the, yeah. That, that, is what, that, that is what the prices are in the futures market. Um, right. Do I believe that? No, I think I, I don't believe that. I think I think the Fed's going to go and just jam rates to four. Interesting. Um, okay, you don't you don't align with that. So then, what's the probability then that the Fed overshoots and you know maybe expects inflation to continue on the trajectory, running hotter and hotter, when maybe you've already seen peak inflation? I mean, I I've heard your statements on uh, the transitory inflationists, and sure, eventually they'll be right. Right, everything in life eventually is transitory, so inflation will be too. But what's the likelihood that the Fed is over is going to overshoot this? And maybe as supply chain bottlenecks relent, uh, prices come down naturally, at least in certain industries or certain compartments of the economy, and inflation isn't as hot as it's perceived to be right now, and the Fed raises rates unnecessarily high. What do you think? 99.8%. Uh, <laughs> well, it, it's by definition, because there's a lag effect to raising rates. So right. they're going to raise rates. And, but they're not going to see the slower economy or the lower inflation or all those other various things for you know two, three, six months. It's not like you raise rates and it happens. Yeah. So by definition, they have to overshoot, um, which is which is how you know. I mean, I mean, recessions don't happen. The Fed you know breaks the toy. So the Fed the Fed will break the toy. The question is how far do you have to get to break the toy? Um, and 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 breaking the toy. I mean, I mean, getting inflation under three, four is their target, so they claim. And um, you have to get, I think you have to get funds above four to do that. I mean, this seems incredible because we're, the market's totally the other way. Um, but but I, I just, I don't see inflation coming down to a four handle. You can have inflation for zero for the next six months and you're still gonna have a four handle for the whole year. So, I mean, it seems incredible to imagine we're gonna get down to their target by you know early next year. Got and it. OER, so, OER is how they measure housing, owner's equivalent rent. They don't measure it by house price. Mm -hmm. They used to, like 30, 40 years ago, they got rid of that because they felt house price was an asset, not a, a flow indicator, not a cost of living in the house. The value of how, what it costs you, what percent of your income does it cost to reside somewhere without owning the actual asset? So this, and that lags six to nine months behind house prices. So if house prices 
are still at their all-time peak right now or last month, then you're gonna see OER continue to rise for the next six to nine months. So that's baked in the cake. Um, oil prices, yeah, they, 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 they've come down, but you know we've also drained half the SPR. <laughs> what's, yeah. gonna happen, what's gonna happen when they run out, run out of oil there and we go into the winter heating season and everything else. So I'm not convinced oil is, uh, is, gonna, is gonna be going a whole lot lower than this. It might get lower, but I mean, I think it goes back up again. And when it goes back up, so let's say gas goes to 350, fine. When it goes back up again, then that counts as inflation and rises things back up. So I, I have a hard time seeing inflation coming down. And then wages, of course, we still have a, it's not, a, it's not an undersupply of labor. We have a mismatch of labor. Um, and um, the way you solve that problem is higher wages to draw people to move or bring people out of retirement. Um, so I don't see inflation coming down. And, and the Fed's going to go and hang their hat on inflation. They're not stopping. What do you mean by a mismatch of labor? What does that mean? Um, so you 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 uh, you, you, know, you you can get into, into into politics here about why we have such an angry electorate, and part of it is that you know we've gone from you know goods to services, and we've gone from manufacturing to technology. So basically, you have to go and take the guy who used to go and. Um, you know, make buggy whips and teach them how to go and, and do some software programming. That's that's yeah. tough to do. Did the government do this? No, they didn't. They did a lousy job of this. Was NAFTA or, or China and WTO, was, was that a, a good or bad idea? From 30,000 feet, it's a great idea. We're bringing in goods at a much lower price. So as a society, we're better off. But the guys that lose their jobs in, you know, in the mills in, in South Carolina, they need to be retrained to do where the demand is for new stuff. As, did we do that? No, unless you have some angry people, justifiably. Can mm. I fix that problem? Not really. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the, so we, we have that. Um, we have two other issues. Um, the biggest one probably is if you look at the inflation of the 70s, what really drove that was the baby boom labor force growth rate. Boomers are actually 46 to 64. They, at age 20, oh, for that cohort, they're getting married at age 26, 27, and the kids at age 27, you know, 28, and they're buying a house, buying a car, buying a washroom, buying a baby, like all this stuff. They're buying, you know, building a household, household formation, buying houses. Yeah. They're buying it from a much smaller group of suppliers, the World War II generation, which is smaller by pure demographic, because they're being born in the depression, but also because they got killed in World War II. Yeah. Um, this is what really drove things. I mean, if you look at a chart, it's one of my favorite charts of all time, of the labor force growth rate versus the 10-year interest rate. Zzz, zzz. Yeah, Paul Borker gets the credit for killing inflation. It's really the pig in the python of the boomer generation maturing and not having as much demand anymore. Right. Now, Right. Now, what do we have? We now have the boomers, their mid-cycle. Their average age is about 65, so only halfway through retirement for them. And they're leaving the workforce. And they're leaving because, one, they're 65. But number two is they've paid a boatload of money in the last 10 years in the stock and bond market. You go look at all, 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 all the charts out there. Who owns most a disproportionate amount of wealth in the country? It's the boomers. Yeah, They can retire on that. And so this magical disappearance of three, four, five million workers, they disappear. They just, they, 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 when they lost their jobs, they just they, they didn't come back. They didn't need That's to. why the participation rate is lower. Right. And, and unemployment has gone down to three and a half because they're not looking for a job. They're on the golf course or wherever they're doing. Um, so this is a shrinking supply of labor. On the other hand, we have the millennials. There are more millennials than there are boomers. The big difference is that the boomer generation as a proportion of the overall population was much, much greater than millennials to our current population. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. There's actually yeah. more millennials than there are boomers. They're forming households probably five years later than boomers. Having kids four or five years later than boomers. I mean, the average age of first child in San Fran is 32. Average age is 31 in New York. I mean, this is much older than, you know, uh, my generation. We yeah. do, and before that, even more than that, um, mm. they are forming households. They're buying 
right? They're doing something like this and they're demanding it from a declining workforce of boomers who are leaving. So thus, you know, you have demand where the supply, uh, you know, it's gonna go push inflation. And finally, of all the un 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 unfortunate policy outcomes that occur, you know, not by, you know, desire, but, but you know, is happenstance, it's not taxation or regulation, it's immigration policy in the US. This is why the US never had the problem that Japan had or Europe had or Russia's gonna have or China's really gonna have. We've had a increasing labor force growth rate and that's come from immigration. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, I don't wanna get into the politics of this. I, I, I said something on, 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 on some Twitter thing and everyone's yelling at me. I, I'm not for open borders, okay? Just knock it off guys, okay? I'm not open borders. But we do need to go and increase, you know, the visa process, create a proper open door. Uh, the immigration, legal and illegal, into the U.S. has declined dramatically, mm -hmm. and we need workers to come in and fill jobs. And to the extent we don't do that, it's going to, we'll be sorry uh, yeah. when we do. And, and the notion that immigrants don't pay taxes is totally bogus. Yeah. They don't pay income taxes, fine, but where they rent the house that landlord's paying property taxes. When You're speaking apply, specifically about illegal immigration. Yeah. They may not pay, pay income tax, but they're paying uh, yeah. purchasing tax. they go to the store to buy goods, they're paying sales tax. They're yeah. paying taxes, not, not income tax. I agree with that. Yeah. Free education, free hospital. I don't want to get involved in that nonsense, but I mean, they are not total moochers. They're adding to our society. And more importantly, is they're keeping a lid on wages by filling jobs that we need to get filled. And yeah. uh, I would say that the massive decline in net immigration over the last six years has been mm. a significant contributor to uh, labor inflation. Do you have any idea what those numbers would be when you say massive decline on immigration over the last six years? And I'm way more, I'd sort of lean on the like a trend towards the leniency when it comes to immigration policy personally. I, I, just my I posted question. it on my most recent commentary and I posted okay. it on, on Twitter uh, a week or two ago, so you can go and find that and post it on the on, on this thing if you want to blend it on in or look at it. But uh, it's it's a the number's not at my fingertips, but you know it's like yeah. from eleven million to four million, some some number like that. I'll, I'll go find it. All right, all right. Now one other trend that you know I just read about this morning, and I'm probably late on the draw because I read about it in the Wall Street Journal when it was probably on TikTok six months ago. But it's a trend called quiet quitting that we're seeing specifically as entrepreneurs in our Gen Z and some millennial employees. And the term reflects sentiment that says, um, we're not trying to get off the payroll, we're not quitting. In fact, we're trying to stay on the payroll, but we're doing as little as possible. And there's a bit of a phenomenon and a trend on TikTok now of employees making videos describing what their ambitions are in the workplace. And it's to say, we're gonna follow our job description absolutely to the letter and not contribute a minute or an ounce of energy over and above that. And on the one hand, you know, I, I first read this and I thought this is hilarious um, and I would be outraged if my team was um, operating this way, doing the bare minimum in order to retain their employment. And as I dove into the story a bit more, it was more focused around um, a preference for work-life balance. Like, look, we're going to work from nine to five. But when we go home, we're not open an email, right? And so it was just a different perspective on, you know, living to work versus working to live, I suppose. Um, I know you're the father of, of four kids, Harley. So, uh, you know, do you have any thoughts on on sentiment trends and the up and coming generations that are going to be the ones building the economy, Gen Z, et cetera? Philosophically speaking, I actually support these guys. I mean, it's unclear to me why a, 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 an hourly worker gets time and a half if he works more than his eight hours in the day, mm -hmm. double time on weekends. Why a salaried worker should be expected to go and work weekends and work nights without getting compensated in some manner, fashion, or form. Sure. In theory, you'd work more than your allotted time because you'd be rewarded with a salary increase or promotion or something like that. Um, if you feel that's not going to occur, then I really don't have a problem with um, you know, working your hours. I agree with the idea of turning off the clack, uh, crackberry after you mm -hmm. leave the office. I agree with the idea of going on vacation. Um, uh, when I went on vacation, um, I mean, this was before the internet, but I mean, I would not read a newspaper for a week. There could be nuclear war. And I would know until I got back and saw the crater. Yeah. Um, when I'd have my people 
uh, leave and go on vacation. I, I, I ran a trading desk. When they'd leave, they might call in to ask how things are going. I'd say, things are fine. Click, I hang up on them. I think you're supposed to, when you take a vacation, unplug. Tell people you are gone and that's it. Um, because you need for your own health and for your productivity when you return to clear your head and clear your thoughts and go on vacation. You should not be returning emails. And by the way, you shouldn't return emails on weekends either because to the extent you do that, you're just giving crack to someone else to go and call you. Just train them, I don't respond on weekends and they'll respect you for that. I, I mean, if it's an emergency, fine. They can go They can go and track you down somehow, but there's really, there's so few emergencies. I, 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 I my very first vacation, um, at Merrill, I, I run this option business and I was kind of, my backup wasn't so great, but it was good enough. I got the position kind of locked on down, but I'm going on vacation. And um, the big boss walks over and says, Harley, like, a, you know, what, what's your plan? What do you, I mean, what do we do if we need you? And I look at the guy and I'm, 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 I'm all of 26, 27 years old, you know, and, and, and I'm not sure what I even thought I was doing. And I said, you can't get a hold of me. If it's a big problem, you know, it's a small problem, you don't need me. If it's a big problem, I can't fix it. Like, what am I going to do from vacation? I mean, <laughs> I'm going to go buy us all 100 million tens? Like, whatever. I, I got the thing set up. It's probably pretty good. I've given instructions to people to go and think crazy, but I really can't fix this problem while I'm away. And, mm. and you're better off having me be fully rested so when I come back, I can go and, you know, go back to the jungle and kill people again. I mean, I mean so I, I, my advice to people is, take a goddamn vacation okay if you're right. watching this thing probably do it and, and um i took my four kids on we went on five rv trips they are extraordinarily you know inexpensive they're amazing and they get you on your kids time not putting your kids on your time so um i posted yeah. a lot of this stuff on my other website bassman.net go there and look take a vacation buddy it's great i've been on this site and i don't know how many countries are listed in your catalog or you, you've sort of uh, documented your family trips, but it's epic, Harley. As the father of three super young boys, it's incredibly aspirational and inspirational. So, no, I, I love it. Uh, and I love what you said, especially in the sense of, um, you know, it's easy to confuse busyness with productivity. And, you know, I can be multitasking on my phone with my kids, cooking dinner, catching up with my wife, but really I'm not really there for any of those four activities. Whereas if I want to knock it out of the park professionally, you know, let's time block, let's go all in, right? And be present and make sure everything's done properly. Same thing with parenting, right? When I'm with my kids, they know if I'm half in, half out, they can perceive that. And same with, you know, fitness, for example, I do triathlon, like pre-race nutrition. Am I doing something else or am I focused on doing it right? You know what I mean? And and all of it. So I love the uh, the focus, I guess, that like comes out of protecting your time that way. Yeah. Well, I will tell you this. Um you know, the idea of giving your kids your fatherly lecture and, and giving them good advice and this and that, at the end of the day, your kids become you. They're watching you all the time. They see what you do. They saw me get up at five in the morning every day for 30 years and then, you know, go on vacation. The weekends we do this or various things my wife did. That's what they do. They, they, they mimic your behavior and actions not the words you give them in that little three minute lecture about mm. giving them good advice. So, um, okay, exactly. here's something, here's something for you. The way I explain what I do to my boys, cause every day I get up, they're up, they want to hang out and play. And I have to explain every day that I, daddy has to go. Right. And it's like this thing every, every morning, of course. So where I landed, you know, explaining why daddy has to disappear every day is that, you know, I play a game and everybody in the world plays a game. You know, and, and my game is creating podcasts, right? And if I do a great job, then we have uh, options in our life that we wouldn't have otherwise. And there's rewards for the game that everybody plays. And if you choose a very complex, challenging game that requires a lot of you, there might be a greater reward. You can also choose a more relaxed game that requires less of you. There might be a less reward. And so now my five-year-old is always asking me questions about sort of like return on time and return on task, right? And, and oh, yeah. uh, I'm starting to like introduce this topic in a delicate way without ever using the term, um, you know, work or job or I have to, right? But more like, I love what I do. I'm, I'm really fortunate in that regard. I, I definitely try to express that to him, but you know, that's what I'm trying to introduce the topic to a five-year-old and my second child who's a three-year-old. 
one year old hasn't got it yet, but we'll get there. But uh, what do you what do you think about and how have you, you know, you're you've raised four kids and and I think that a pretty great job based on what I've seen. So how how did you introduce those topics to your kids, Charlie? I mean, ultimately you have to love what you do. Um if you don't, it's work, it's work, you just could be struggling along. I mean, I love Sundays because next day is Monday, I get to go back to work. It sounds mm -hmm. crazy, but I, I love what I did. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it was a different environment back then where Wall Street was very creative. They would let you really make up new products and do anything you wanted to do, and they'd fund you to go and do it. Mm -hmm. That world now is tech. I mean, the mm -hmm. Google office where my daughter works is like, you know, the Merrill Lynch office, you know, 40 years ago. Um, when I worked there, you know, they, we, they used to take our order the day before at noon, they'd roll the cart in and give us lunch at our desks. I, I guess I'm not sure eating at your desk is a good or bad thing, but, um, uh, you know, um, they, 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 they did that. That's pretty strange, isn't it? Sorry. Yeah. So, no, um, good. Uh, yeah, and, and, but now my daughter at Google, I mean, Google owns from what, 17th to 18th, from 9th all the way to the water plus thing. They have all these cafeterias with, 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 with uh, you know, Chinese and sushi and this and Mexican and that. And they have rock climbing walls and yoga rooms and everything else. But they want you to never leave the place. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. and they go and they say, you know what? We want you to take 15% of your time and not do work. We want you to make something up. Just dream something up. Um, I think Gmail came from that. It wasn't, no one ever said make up Gmail. They said, you know, dream it up and someone dreamed it up. Um, I think you know, I, th I think that's very important for people to go and, you know, be creative and think and, and, and companies, I think the best companies do that. So, and if uh, those ideas are funneled correctly, what a great, I mean, that's sort of Bezos mentality. He attributes his success to his at-bats, right? Not his genius or his foresight. He's like, I just swing at more, more pitches than anybody else. And I strike out way more than anybody else, but I get more at that. So when I hit the ball, sometimes things work. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's all about probabilities. There's no certainties in any projects you're working on. I will say that that, that uh, I'd, I'd like to say that, 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 that I know what I'm doing, but at times I don't. Uh, my boys were asking me in, in 07, uh, 08, if uh, Merrill's going to go bankrupt. And I laughed and said, it's ridiculous. We can't go bankrupt. I went through a whole reason. Those reasons why we couldn't go bankrupt. Um, hmm. I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we go back and we did um right. but, uh you know it, it's a uh, you know you survive you survive, you survive oh man there's a whole episode right there harley okay <laughs> very good stories there yeah yeah we'll have to come back and do that one okay i want to wrap up with a couple uh couple questions uh number one book you recommend to my my listeners harley that's influenced you professionally personally anything like that god i Put mean for, for if, if, if you want to be involved in Wall Street, that kind of stuff, inside the Yield book by Homer Leibowitz is the Bond Bible. It's it's tough reading, but I mean, you know, if you want to know about interest rates, um, that's the best thing out there. You know, um, I love Bonfire of the Vanities because it was actually true, um, but that's mm -hmm. also old New York, so I'm, I'm probably dating myself. Okay. Inside the Yield book. Inside the Yield book. All right. Uh, media source that you couldn't live without platform, blog site, uh, mainstream organization? Um, I, I mean, look, I, I, I read the journal, and I read the times. Um, it, it, it's unfortunate that, you know, these things have become, you know, more political. I, I understand why there, there's no more classified ads to pay the way. Now they have to actually go and get readers to pay. So you have to give them what they want. So it's a, it's unfortunate. Um, but as far as like thought provoking, I love Commentary Magazine. Um, it, it, it's very interesting stuff there. It's it, it's a it's a niche kind of thing, um, but 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 good writers and, and good ideas. Okay, and then I'll, I'll point people to convexitymaven.com. That's your blog. You're up there every four to six weeks with the kind of medium medium form article, not not necessarily long form. It's it's you get through it in a, in a morning over a coffee, um, and it's more detailed than probably a lot of retail can can swallow, but good to sit there and sit with it. And and you always wrap it up nicely in the final thoughts for anybody who maybe the, the small points were lost, you know? You know, it's 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 hard to write those because it's just, where do you want to go? I I, I, I I want to try to get in the middle, which is which for a lot of people may be too high uh, for, you know, a hedge fund manager is going to be, you know, probably too light. Uh, I, and I also want to go and give some ideas about 
you know, how to invest and 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 make money in the longer term. I, I mean, you know, I I, I say you know, most of the I have a coda of saying um uh, sizing is more important than entry level. You're just not going to pick the top or the bottom. It's just not going to happen, and don't think it's going to happen. Uh, you want to invest enough into an asset class or an asset so if you're right, it'll make a difference. But if you're wrong, it won't wipe you out. And I think people really they get hung up on trying to go and time the market, and um, yeah, um, it doesn't work. And and and, and you got to go and you're you're probably right with your idea. You're probably right, um, unless you're throwing darts. Um, which just means your timing may not be right. And so it's a matter of, can you size it such that you, that you can survive the drawdown, all right? I mean, yeah. I think the biggest problem of 2020 was not that people, you know, uh, you know didn't buy on the way up, is they sold on the way down and they got stopped out. Um, if you kept the right size, you could ride the whole thing. End of the day, you know, stocks will be higher. If only by inflation, they'll be higher nominally. But they, they're gonna be higher over the time horizon. Um, and keep liquidity, keep enough liquidity so if you have an important expense coming up, you're not forced to sell at the wrong time. Um, and and uh, basic management like that, which is really hard to do. Um, then finally, this general career advice to people, um, you know, go into the bathroom, close the door, hips on your knees and have that honest conversation who am I? What is my real skill? You know, um, not what you'd love to be, but where you have a marginal advantage. So, you know, like on Wall Street, everyone wants to be the trader, you know, uh, the, the big hotshot. Um, there's lots of people who don't have it, you know, in their system to go and do that thing for a variety of reasons. Maybe they're better in sales or research or marketing or in systems or whatever it might be. And maybe the ego is not as good, but you'll be a success because you're in the area where you actually have a marginal advantage with somebody else. Just be honest and find that place and go there and you will do very well in your world. Don't try to go and, and, and put the square peg into the round hole by, by, by following the, these ideas or dreams of other people. Um, uh, and, 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 then, and, 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 and then work won't be work, it'll be fun. I love that. Well, that's that's rad. You know, I was going to ask you about your sizing versus timing statement. I think you wrap up most of your letters that way. And and I think you put that nicely. You know, if you're right, it makes a difference. And if you're wrong, you know, you don't get wiped out. You stay at the table, which is rule number one, I think, for all investors is stay at the table. Yes. Understand the time horizon, right? Everybody wants to be rich tomorrow. Uh, but, you know, the markets are far more frequently um, not a get rich quick scheme, they're a go broke fast scheme or a get rich slow scheme. And understanding that's important. Um, I love the keep liquidity lesson. I've learned that the hard way and had to sell at uh, an inopportune time to cover expenses that I wished I had liquidity for. Maybe it's one of those lessons you have to learn because you're right, it's hard to do. But if you learn it once or twice, it's easier to do uh, once you have the scar tissue. And uh, I love the, uh, the self meditation and finding that competitive advantage, right? What is your competitive advantage and where should you really be doubling down? Um, excellent place to wrap this interview up, Harley. I really appreciate your time. This is super fun. Okay, man. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Have a good day. You too. You too. All right. Thank you for watching this interview. Now, three things before I let you go. Number one, I publish a weekly newsletter and I love writing it. I share my biggest takeaways and action items from the conversations that I have on this channel. In addition, my thoughts on current events, economic events, political events, and you can subscribe for free. Just hit the pinned comment right beneath this video or just go to jmartin.club and you can subscribe on the website. I'd love to have you join the team. Number two, ad revenue from this channel is donated to an organization that is super close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Now, Zero Ceiling's mission is to end youth homelessness. And the way they do this is by giving at-risk urban youth the opportunity to relocate to beautiful wilderness areas and then provide them with supportive housing, career training, and just generally positive influences on their life. I love what they do. Check them out if you're interested. And number three, if you prefer to listen to my content as opposed to watch it, you can find me wherever you listen to your podcast. Just search for The Jay Martin Show. All right, thanks again.